Welcome to Little Tibet, Toronto, Canada. The Parkdale neighborhood is home to the largest Tibetan community in North America. You walk down any street in Parkdale and you can feel the presence of the Tibetan community. I can look to my left and I'll see a Tibetan flag on a balcony. I'll look to my right and I'll see Tibetan prayer flags. In front of me, a Tibetan elderly woman will walk by me with prayer beads in her hands. You can't throw a stone without hitting a Tibetan restaurant. We have lots of momos, which are Tibetan dumplings. Delicious, you must try them. The Tibetan community in Parkdale, they are helping those people who just newly arrived here. They will just give you a sense of brotherhood. It's one of the few places where Tibetans can live freely and be proud of who they are. When I come to Canada, oh, I found so many big, big buildings. In Toronto, there are so many migrants, migrants from all over the world. My dad and mom, they exited from Tibet. I was born in India. I came to Canada in 2012. This is my restaurant, Logos Corner. People come from all over Toronto to eat my momo. So many people, they say, oh, you are a hero of Parkdale. I don't know, I'm just... Loga is always Loga. <laughs> this one is potato and veggie, oh, this one beef? Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you, uh, thanks, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Very nice. How's it, ma? I don't want to say I'm famous, but people love my food and people like love me. They're saying that this restaurant is not a restaurant. They feel like home. I open Every day, I close only for one day, Tibetan New Year. I'm a workaholic. It's more like exercise to me. Yeah, I'm healthy and even though I work 13 hours, 14 hours, it's not difficult. My wife works in the kitchen, making, mixing, prep, each and everything done by her. Secret to our success is love and understanding. Me and my wife make hot sauce together. Yeah, with Mexican mole, Thai chili, and Indian ground chili, with cumin, with garlic. And I have to add a little cheese. Cheese is one that gives a very good taste. This sauce is very special. A very good combination with Momo. And everybody loves my hot sauce. The secret of the good Momo is good quality of meat. In my basement, I have eight Tibetan grandma working with me. They make momo with beef, vegetable, potato, pork, chicken. They work very hard, but a little bit slow. When I first serve a momos to Canadian, they say, oh, wow, very good. And then they love to come again and again and again and again. Wow. <laughs> 
This is a little Tibet, and there are so many Tibetan restaurants. There's no competition. We are very, very friendly. There are so many, nearly about 11 or 12 restaurants who serve Tibetan food. This food is not just a food. I'm preserving my culture and tradition. Making Tibetan momo, I'm making Tibetan culture alive. My father was a monk in 1959. A lot of monks left the monastery, like my father did, and basically he became a warrior. When the Dalai Lama was escaping, he was one of the tail and guards that blew up bridges to make it difficult for the Chinese to follow. <laughs> My mother was ripped out of Tibet in her youth. Everybody was fleeing and said, you can't go back. There is no home anymore. It's been just a year since I arrived in Canada. I left Tibet when I was seven years old with my parents and siblings. We have to basically walk from Tibet to Nepal uh, through the very mountainous terrains, which is uh, filled with, you know, ice and snow. It took almost like three weeks. There are so many Tibetans who couldn't reach because of the frostbite and some people even died. In India, Nepal and Bhutan, the Tibetan people, they don't have any uh, status. They are not getting much job. They are not entitled to own any kind of uh, properties, land, houses. So because of that, they started to coming to abroad, like different Western countries, including Canada. Tibetans were invited to come to Canada in the 1970s. Only 240 came. I was lucky enough that two of them were my parents. Families like mine were put into rural areas People were very nice, but we didn't speak English. Money was hard. I felt like I belonged, but I felt like I was different. The children couldn't get the opportunities they needed in a town of 16,000. So I moved here. I was 18 years old. Parkdale at that time, there were lots of people with, you know, begging for money. You know, the homes were economical, and it became like a center because we had no community center at that time. Tibetans have actually helped the community become better and contributed to jobs, opened up stores. So everybody's looking to go somewhere and feel like they belong. If you go to Parkdale, that is what you'd see, that community of a bunch of people that are going to welcome you. I was referred to a Tibetan lady uh, who was uh, walking in the Parkdale Intercultural Association and she has helped me in filling the forms and applying for the permanent residency in Canada. My refugee application got approved in the November of 2021. I would like to stay in Canada until Tibet become independent. <laughs> My parents, they are in Nepal, Kathmandu, so I, I, I'm all alone in, in this country. I don't know many people over here. So because of that, sometimes you feel very lonely in, in this country. If the Parkdale and the Tibetan community is not here in Canada, then definitely my life will be much more difficult and much more lonely, I think. Seeing the monks, seeing those old people, uh, reciting those prayers, it just reminds me who I am and where I belong, you know. We were the first immigrants 
refugees that work to, to build it for the other refugees to come here. Every generation after, they lose a little bit of what it's like to be Tibetan. And we need them to hear it from the first people that came. This center has been one of the central spaces for Tibetans to just gather and to just be around your own people. Without culture, I personally feel like there is like a really big part of you that's missing. We have Tibetan Buddhist classes, Tibetan dance classes, and Tibetan language classes. <laughs> For probably five years now, in total, I've been teaching Tibetan traditional dance. A lot of the ways in which we preserve our cultural identity is, is by learning it, is by making sure it's preserved, making sure that it's an active culture and, and we're not talking about it as if it's disappearing. songs and dances that are being performed are being accompanied by um, this instrument. This is called um, a Tibetan damnyin. We call it damnyin and in English it's like a six-stringed lute. The biggest difference between this and a Western guitar is that there aren't chords. We play them um, usually along with the melody. Tibetans, we are not a monolith. There are so many different regions, so many different dialects, so many different styles of dancing. And for me, it's really important to make sure that I'm doing my best to introduce the children to all of these different aspects. For the last couple of years in Parkdale, Tibetans from all walks of life, all ages, joined together in front of the high school to practice and to perform Koshe together. Korshe, um, if you translate that directly into English, it's literally circle music dance. Um, and I think it's like a really meaningful way for like community to dance together. If you ask me to go to the gym for 20 minutes, <laughs> I'll be exhausted and I'll just like, I'll lose motivation, but I can dance for like five hours straight without sitting down once. When I dance, first and foremost, I dance for myself because this is the way that I connect with my ancestors. And as I dance for myself, it becomes a part of the community. I was born in Nepal. I moved to Canada with my dad and my brother in 1999. So I was around six years old at the time. I think there's this really deep desire to belong. And I think when something is taken away from you, it, like, it, becomes, it becomes that much more important. And so like, just the fact that I can't go to Tibet, it's something that I care about so much. And like, to answer your question simply, like why do I do it? It's just because I love it. It's something that makes me feel human. It makes me feel whole. Art is definitely a form of activism and resistance for Tibetans inside and outside Tibet. The Chinese government's main sort of strategy to get rid of Tibetans is to remove us from our culture. This is how we honor Tibetans inside of Tibet by continuing um, this part of our culture. This is Chimi Lamo, my friend. Uh, we've known each other for so long, and in our community, she is the youngest board member ever to um, be a part of the Tibetan Canadian Cultural Center's board. Ever since, we've just kind of been each other's biggest hype girls, <laughs> going through life together, and continuing to find ways to like support each other and I'm just really, really blessed to have her in my life and I'm forever grateful for her. 
Since the age of 13, I started volunteering with various organizations, be it uh, Tibet-related or human rights-related. I am who I am because of my community. They have made me who I am, and till the last breath, I will be working to serve these communities of mine. Parkdale is a mix of uh, very affluent houses, uh, but along with that, there are many high rises, which is where many Tibetans and immigrant communities live. There's so many inequities that exist within our society, uh, and especially in Parkdale, it's quite obvious about community members that live, uh, you know, at the margins of our society and are often forgotten. We realize that if nobody did anything, that they would fall through the cracks. Twice a week, every Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, I'm able to be part of a huge network of community members that come together and deliver food uh, to elders in our community. This senior, because she's not home, we're gonna leave it like that for him, her, and off to the next delivery. It's not a charity service. Uh, we're not here to save anybody. We are engaging in a communal effort to be there for each other, to care for each other. Okay, now we gotta go to that building. Next, come on. When one is down, we make sure that we all work together to make sure that they're up. This is why I love our community, because anywhere you go, you see your own people. And even if you don't know them by their name, you can say, hi, hello, how your day is going. And he started telling me about all this politics that's happening in our exile community. And I was like, okay, great. And he started asking me about you guys. And so it's just nice. Sense of community, belonging, you know? My uncle, Tewong, he was the first person that saw me when I was born. Uh, so I feel like I have a deeper connection with him. A lot of community members live the way my uncle does. You know, you often see beds uh, in the living room where there is a huge altar and there's water bowl offerings. My uncle lives in the street um, where there's a lot of high-rise apartment buildings that are subjected to gentrification and just absurd rent hikes. I have been here since 2008 onwards, right? Then the rent used to be about $800 per month. From 2014, 15, 16 onwards, they have raised to such an extent like the monthly rent went up to $1,750 for just one bedroom. Almost double. Almost double. They want you to just move out of there. How has life changed for you? Lots of my friends of my age, they have all moved away because of this increase in rent. I'm afraid that in the next 20 years, uh, Little Tibet might not be even existing in Parkdale. On a personal level, that sucks. Specifically for the Tibetan people, we've been displaced so many times. And so, you know, I would ask, uh, where next? Many tenants in Parkdale are being displaced because of the forces of gentrification. Even on the street level with the businesses, we have seen a lot of the older stores that served immigrant needs uh, disappear and it be replaced with more upscale, fancy restaurants, which most of the residents of Parkdale cannot afford. I was elected into office in 2018. 
it was a historic moment because for the first time, a person of Tibetan heritage was elected into public office in North America. The overwhelming majority of Parkdale residents are tenants. I ran on issues like better and improved housing. In November 2021, I put forward a proposal that would remove the incentive for landlords to evict tenants and increase their profits. Um, the government voted it down. We're seeing Toronto become a city for the few, uh, not for the majority working class people who have built the city. I would question, is pushing people out of their homes, out of their communities, progress? Parkdale Community Legal Services has been such an incredible organization working alongside tenants and supporting them in this fight against the big multinational corporations. Honestly, I consider it a privilege to work in Parkdale. I think that the strength and intelligence exhibited by working class people in this neighborhood is, is inspiring. Most of the apartment buildings in Parkdale were built in the 50s and 60s, and ever since, landlords have exploited tenants in Parkdale. But what we've seen happen more recently is that corporate landlords and financial entities have bought up the rental stock in Parkdale. These landlords control upwards of 50% of all rental units in the neighborhood. Once the unit is vacant, there is no limit on how high the rent can be raised. So doing aesthetic uh, improvements to the buildings is one way that landlords price out long-time tenants. They're allowed to pass these costs off on the tenants who have been living there. Other strategies that landlords use include neglecting maintenance and repairs in tenants' units. The specific tactics that tenants have used in fights against evictions and rent increases include organized rent strikes where hundreds of tenants will withhold their rent payments until their demands have been met by the landlord. There is strength in numbers. The tenants on Tyndall Avenue in Parkdale collected well over half of their neighbors' signatures on a petition opposing the landlord's bid to raise rent above the guideline. We walked over to a local rental office, the property manager of the building. We were immediately locked out. Hi, I want to uh, deliver a petition about the above guideline rent increase. Today, there's no one on site allegedly who can accept the petition that, and so tenants are forced to hold their ground here in the lobby until somebody with authority can come and accept their petition. Do you like to leave it with me? I can pass it over to you, or accept it on behalf of a property manager at your site. Yeah, this is what I want to formally uh, give to you. All right, it's in there, it's a, it's a petition. I'm a regular at Loga's Cafe in Parkdale. Thanks for helping all so many people, you know. I would wager that the majority of Loga's customers are people who rent apartments in Parkdale. I think the fact is that Tibetan people are essential workers in the economy of Toronto. I don't think we can underestimate the social and human consequences of what's going on in the neighborhood.
My hope for Parkdale is that it continues to be the place where everyone, whether you're a newcomer or whether you were born right in the neighborhood, feels like they belong. For me, existence is resistance. And Parkdale, our community doesn't just exist, we thrive. While we're waiting for our real home where we belong, this is like what we have right now. And it's something that a lot of Tibetans are really, really grateful for. There's so much to learn from Little Tibet. You know, our sense of community is our biggest strength. And so let us continue to be there for each other and uh, rise together.